Okay. To talking to like, yeah, you, you're, you're, you guys speak. are going to share a mic. That's fine. Then just we, act like you're in love or something. Crew. <laughs> this is actually probably the best like angling. <laughs> what? If we talk, like I this. forgot that I'm doing this with a couple. This is going to be gross. <laughs> oh my god, Ben, I'm so sorry. If I was an editor, I'd lose it. All right, we ready? Everyone, sync the audio. That did nothing. <laughs> Welcome everybody to another episode of The Discussion. Today we'll be talking about Portrait of a Lady Aflame. Or is this nope, otherwise not known? quite Portrait of a Lady on Fire. I was doing a thing and you, you ruined it. Were you doing a it. bit? Do yeah. it again, start over. So this, uh, actually Emily, do you want to go ahead and give us the backstory of this film and why we chose it? Yes, um, we chose this film because we we're talking about the AFI Top 100 list and how it has all of these movies that did so much for film um, to date. But one of the things that it most notably lacks is like a sh like strong female characters th present throughout the list completely. When Daniel and Noah started reviewing these movies and I started watching them with Noah a lot, I just started thinking about some of my favorite movies that have female representation, have great female conversations, and more importantly, show the way that women love women. And when I thought of that, Portrait of a Lady on Fire came to mind, and Daniel and Noah got really excited and on board and decided to watch it and review it for the channel. One of the important like metrics for me as well is like for trying to figure out like whether female representation is working in a movie is do the characters go beyond just what they are established as like right away? Like if there's just a character who's introduced who's like, oh, this is who they are, and then they never develop, I'm mm -hmm. usually like, even if it's male, female, gay, straight, whatever, usually like that's just a bad character, um, which takes us to this film, which I would like to say is kind of like a continual stripping back of who these people are. So it's like the whole story is you getting to know them and their dynamic better. Mm -hmm. Because it's really interesting to me, I found for Portrait of the Fire, how what both characters are first established as, you see like that's a portion of who they are, but most of the story is like just to get a obvious low-hanging metaphor. It's almost like the painting of a portrait of these characters. <laughs> portrait of a Lady on Fire is a 2019 film. It's a French film by director Celine Sciamma. Um, it won numerous awards and it follows mostly the story of two women. Um, one, a painter named Marianne, and the other, the daughter of uh, a wealthy countess whose name is Heloise. The daughter's name is Heloise. Um, and the daughter, Heloise, is betrothed to be married, um, I would say, against her will, right? It's not, it's not a marriage that she wants to be a part of. And usually, typically, uh, in this time period, they exchange, would exchange gifts, portraits of each partner prior to the wedding. And so Marianne is hired to do a portrait of um, Heloise. The main problem here is that Heloise does not want to be married. Obviously, uh, a romance, like a love, ensues. It becomes much more complicated than just being someone's companion and me? being their painter. Um, and it is a beautiful, beautiful love story and is a absolutely magnificent movie. I highly recommend anyone who's watching this review watch the movie. Not to Wonderful. immediately focus on like a hyper specific part of the movie, but I think it's a really good example. So there's a lot of talk in Hollywood about like over sexualization of like cinematography and how like everything's focused on butts, ass. And then people ask like, well, okay, how should you communicate lust without having a camera that does that? This movie is maybe the most lustful film it's I have like, ever it's seen. It's the horniest movie I've ever watched. It's, it's so, so horny. horny, but it does does not ever rely on like a butt shot to communicate that. It's like the the movie has like this really intentional slowness to it. The mm -hmm. characters talk painfully slow. They move right. painfully slow. They mm -hmm. talk quietly and and it makes you pay attention so much more and when you start to kind of like lose one of your senses, you lose your hearing ability almost uh, watching this movie because number one, it's in a different language, and number two, it is so freaking quiet. Your visualization starts to pick up on so much more um, because you're kind of forced to. When I finished watching this movie for the first time, I like immediately knew I was like, these um, actresses are queer, and sure enough, they are. You know, because they like the way that their love is portrayed is so perfectly captures the way that like women love each other, which is number one, like intentional, you know, the 
word choice is intentional. I was listening to like other podcasts talk about this movie uh, or reviews and someone said they talk like they're playing chess with each other. And I was thinking to myself, have you ever heard women like have a conversation ever? <laughs> like it's always chess, you know, you ask somebody. There's so much subtext in every dialogue. Between, there is like, so much subtext in every conversation between two women, you know, always, 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 always. I may ask you how your day was, but in reality, I know how your day was. I'm just giving you a chance to talk to me about it because I know that that might be nice for you. You know what I mean? Like there is always 10 different layers to the way that women talk about each other, talk to each other, and that is done so perfectly in this movie. Um, and the way that, like, women watch each other, I think is is so um, perfectly captured in this as well. This is such a quick example, but I'll never forget. This is, like, the most perfect example of, like, how this played out between me and my best friend Maddie is, like... Maddie from Please Dear God, Maddie from Please Dear God, Don't Be a Bomb. <laughs> but we're so hyper-attuned to each other's emotions now because we as women are almost like trained to do that to be hyper aware of every situation so that we can react accordingly one time I walked into her apartment I twisted the doorknob and she went what's wrong (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't said a word and it was it was and I immediately like started crying I was like no, and I just got this big fight, blah, 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 and, you know, and, and, but it was... We've never been in a fight. It was uh, <laughs> from the twisting of a doorknob, you know, and that is what this movie captures perfectly. Mm-hmm. It's in the quality of dialogue, because it is one of those movies where every sentence you immediately replay in your head, and you're like, well, what was that really about? Like, what does that actually mean? And I found myself, <laughs> like, I was at first, like, okay, I'm watching this movie, and I was taking notes on, like, ideas for my book, and I realized, like, halfway through the movie, I had, like, one note, because every time I <laughs> looked away from the screen I was like what like I missed something really important (laughs) you start to get like the horny glances you know like you get the like the lingers on the jaw and the lingers on the ear and then you're you're and the and then you feel the tension in the space between them it's almost like they're moving like magnets through the movie you can you can physically see and feel that space between them Mm -hmm. and then they start talking and then it gets so much hornier (laughs) I think this this film, um, the dialogue itself is so important and is just like really a testament to the to the screenwriting in this because there's a line where Marion says, um, "Oh, I thought of you last night," and Heloise says, "You dreamt of me," and Marion says, "No, I thought of you last night," which is I know it's going to sound really dumb on the other on like on the internet, but it is. It's important to notice that because the act of thinking implies that it was intentional. I took the time. I made the choice to think of you, whereas, like, dreaming would be an accident. Like, it would be a happy accident, but you accidentally dream of someone, but you intentionally thought of that person, and that says so much more. I also just think that dreaming implies some kind of idealization of a person. It's like when people say, you're my dream girl. You know, Mm -hmm. you are... You are... Everything I've ever wanted and more. You're putting me on this pedestal of, you know, everything that I thought you would be. You're perfect. And I think when you think of somebody, you're not putting them in an, in a light that isn't accurate or doesn't reflect who they are. You're thinking of who they are, their their pros, their cons, their beauties, their flaws, you know. And, and I think that implies such a deeper, more beautiful love. Mm -hmm. So if you were a French viewer, a French person, or someone who speaks French watching this movie, you may have caught this, but I thought it was absolutely fascinating. Um, Oh yes, Noah speaks French for context. (laughs) I speak some French. Un petit peu. Uh, There is, (laughs) and so in a lot of romance languages, you have like the formal and the informal you. So in Spanish, it's what, usted Mm -hmm. and tu. And in French has the same thing. It's vous, which is the formal you, and tu, which is the informal, like, I'm talking to my friends, tu. Um, the entire film, Marianne refers to Heloise as vous and vice versa. Um, even after they've kissed, even after they have slept together, the entire film they say, Spoiler warning. Vous. They sleep together. At the <laughs> very, the very, actually, I think the last line, the, the last line of dialogue anyways, Heloise says, Retourne toi or retourne toi with informal two, which is like the very first time that's said, and it says so much about where their relationship is and how significant that is. And that's like that in itself is a callback to the story of uh, 
Eucydides and Orpheus, which oh, is which is a whole beautiful. thing we need to unpack. I don't even know if we should just go through the plot of the movie really quick because we haven't even talked about like the fact that they end up getting together, they sleep together, they have this like whirlwind romance in ten days, and that's then, right. It's only a few days, and then the Countess mm-hmm. leaves, and they get this additional five days. So it's a it's a two week period that okay. they have this this love, this romance, you know, build, and then they go their separate ways. You know, they Marianne goes back to France and or to Paris and teaches children how to do portraits and is a painter herself. And Heloise goes off and gets married and has kids and they never see each other again, you know? And, uh, okay, there's two really important things I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk about the Eucydides... Orpheus. Orpheus. Story. Story. And I also want to talk about, if you put a gun to my head and said, Emily, what's one word to describe this movie? I would say... Horny. Choice. The movie is about choice. It... And, and that's how it starts, and that's how it ends, is Heloise saying, I don't want to marry this man. Marianne saying, you know, it's okay, there's going to be art there, you'll be just fine. And she's like, you will never understand me because you have choice. I don't have choice, you know, and... Um, and this resentment for that fact and this and this misunderstanding that you simply cannot understand someone who has autonomy versus does not have autonomy. Um, and and it's so that's like obviously like one of the big points Sorry. of the movie. And then second is like is the consent, you know, the choice and the consent. And and that leads into um, when the women kiss for the first time, they have scarves over their mouths. And I read a review that that was done super intentionally because you have to pull away the scarf to kiss the person. So the scarf is this metaphor for consent. Like you have to like you yourself remove your scarf to like show your consent for like accepting the kiss. It is one of those movies that I watched for the first time and the screen went black and I thought to myself, I will never be okay ever again. (laughs) (laughs) This is probably, I know I've said this a lot, but this is probably my favorite part of the movie. Is so the whole it is movie. It is a <laughs> okay, part. Daniel, I literally was talking to Noah on the way over here, and I was like, Noah, I have an issue. And and he was like, what's up, Emma? And, and I was like, I am genuinely scared to review this movie. And he was like, why? And I said, I think this might be my Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> And he was so like, "You're saying this is the Twilight I, for intelligent like, snobs." He was like, "What do you mean?" And I said, no, I "If exactly. somebody said anything bad about this movie, I think I would immediately turn into one of Daniel's followers and be like, mm, you know nothing." <laughs> The most I'll push back on you in that is I can absolutely understand some people being like, this just isn't my type of movie. But I 100%. do not understand anyone who can say this is a bad movie. It is mm. slow. It is in French. Yep. It is a movie that requires 100% of your attention for two hours straight. And just ultimately, it is sad. Like, yes. so your, very, payoff is that, sad. your payoff is a sad ending. It's a, it's a tragedy. Yeah. Like it. It's a, tra- it's a uh, I wouldn't call it Shakespearean, but there's a, another word for... I'm just gonna stick with tragic. Depressing. It is. It's a saddie. <laughs> yeah. It's a saddie. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay. So one of my favorite parts of the movie is when the mom at some point leaves. Right. The countess goes away on a trip. And what's the, her name again? I'm so sorry. Countess. They don't really say her name. It's okay. like, but we know her as the countess in the movie. I could look it up, but then I'd be lying. Like I knew it. And she leaves for five days, and that's when like the bonding of the three women of the household occurs the most. Right. We have Sophie, the servant servant maid of the house um we have heloise and we have marianne and their friendship just like blossoms and it becomes so beautiful and so cute and they just drink wine together and they play cards and they read stories together and it's amazing did you catch them playing egyptian rat screw by the way yeah. did you notice yeah, that cool. i was like wow how long has that been around like <laughs> by the way if you don't know that it's a card game is what we're talking yeah. about if you don't know what that is so they're playing yeah. cards and then they tell then they read this poem. Well, they're playing cards and then on another night, yeah, one of the other nightly activities is to read a book together. Yes. And they Wonderful. open up this Greek mythology book and they're reading it. This my I love this part so much because they're reading it out loud like it's a soap opera. They go, Eucydides, um, you know, goes to the underworld and pleads with um Orpheus pleads. Or, or sorry, Orpheus pleads and 
and he gets his bride back and and they're like, oh my gosh, how romantic. He's so brave for doing that. I wonder what will happen next, you know, like as they're reading the book and it's just like, so then they- um, Spoiler warning, although this is 2000 years old at this point, so- Yeah, yeah. Greek religion <laughs> spoiler warning. Oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Noah. By the way, Jesus dies on the cross. Uh, we're getting a lot of the spoilers out of the way. Plot twins. Who? <laughs> he comes back though. Orpheus goes down and pleads with the gods of the underworld to say, you know, please can I have my bride back? Please, um, can can she come back up to the surface with me? And the underworld gods are so moved by his speech and with for his love for his bride that they say, yes, you can take her with you on the condition that you do not look at her until you surface from the underworld, right? And he says, yes. And Eusidides says, yes, great, you know. And they start going out of the underworld together. And how it reads in the movie is out of some point of impatience and fear of making sure that Eusidides gets out Safely and his impatience for seeing her face, he turns. Orpheus turns Orpheus around. Orpheus turns around. He sees Eucydides. She's immediately dragged back into the underworld and dies for a second time. And there is this debate amongst the girls. They're talking to each other. You know, Sophie, the youngest one, is um, and and they want her to seem young in this because she's just outraged. Why would he do that? That's so stupid. Blah blah blah. You know, he was told one simple thing and that was not to look at her, you know. You know, Marianne is like, yes, I understand, you know, it was silly, blah, 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 you know, but maybe he made the poet's choice, not the lover's choice. Halloween just takes it one step farther and says, what if she said turn around? Retourne-toi. And... <laughs> Just like melted, it was like dagger to the heart. It was like, oh my god! It, was, I don't know. It just, it just did so much for me. It's like, and then after they read this story, Marianne starts to see ghost-like images of Heloise throughout the house in her wedding dress. She'll be walking down a hall, and she'll feel the presence of Heloise behind her, and she'll turn around and she'll see the ghost of her in her wedding dress, and it'll immediately disappear. This happens like two or three times. It scared me one time. Yeah. I was like, "What the fuck?" And no, no, was like, he doesn't actually see her, right? And I'm like, "No, it's a ghost. It's an idea. It's an imagination." You know, blah blah blah, and then. The final goodbye scene between the two of them, they're just like, it's one last final crushing and beautiful embrace. And then Marianne just turns on a heel and books it for the door because it's you can feel this idea of like, if I don't fucking get out of here as fast as I can, I will never leave and I will never want to say goodbye to this woman, you know. And so she's sprinting down the stairs. She gets to the door and you hear, turn around. Retourne toi. And Heloise is standing on the stairs in her wedding dress. And it was almost like Heloise's blessing of, like, marry the memory of me. You know, marry the idea of me. Oh and, oh, Not to mention, dialogue-wise, it is a literal callback to that moment in the movie. Because the words, and that's what I caught this time, like, the words that um, Heloise says that, she, that Eucydides might have said to Orpheus is return et toile, is, like, turn around, and that's the exact same dialogue that gets said at the very end of the film, so it's very much like we're deliberately placing this scene, this current scene, on top of the metaphor that we set up earlier in the movie. Mm. It's wonderful. That movie. seems about as high as a note as we could end this one on. <laughs> so I, I think we will go ahead and wrap things on up here. If you were going to remake the AFI Top 100 today, would you put it in your Top 100 films? Emily. I mean, a million percent, yes. The obvious There's joke just... was to go no. Like, and I then know. it was just hard cut to black. I cannot even joke no about this. Like, I wish I could just be like, make this into a big old funny and say, no, I actually hated this movie and I had so many problems with it. But 
It is one of my favorite films I've seen. It is probably in my top 10 favorite films of all time, if not in the top five of my favorite films in the all time mm-hmm. of all time. It is so special to I me. I it was going to be just solid number one. I, it might be my solid number okay. one. I am also just a person who shies away from ever saying my number one movie, song, anything ever. Um, but it, it genuinely might be my favorite movie of all time. It feels like I, it is my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Ben, just cut it! Just cut it! You can just say that because you know why? And I was thinking about this on the way over here too. I was like, this feels like my movie. Mm. Like, this feels like it's mine. And I can't even believe other people are allowed to watch it. That's it's actually, my movie. I, I forget who I was reading a book by, but they were talking about how, like, you know you've had, like, an impactful piece of art when it, you feel like ownership. Like, you feel oh, like yeah. this is mine. And mm-hmm. even though it's like, you didn't make it, whatever, you're just like, this spoke to a part of me that was dying like it yeah. almost only and I love watching it with Noah but it almost only feels appropriate to watch it by myself Noah's like <laughs> Noah's like I love to watch that with you today I love to share that space with you and I'm like mm, really because that's my space <laughs> no of course this goes on my top list I mean this is right up there with um Schindler's List which I feel like it's comparing two very different movies but in terms of like quality of the film in terms yeah. of like oh my god I just I something that leaves a mark on you, which by the way, yeah, I fully agree. I feel like that when I watched this movie, this is the second time that I've seen it. When you see a piece of art of any kind of art, I feel like you know that um, something has been accomplished when it truly impacts you when you leave it feeling changed or moved, like truly moved in a different way when it's able to evoke those emotions from you. And for two hours, basically all it is, is just a huge range of emotions for me so yeah this i think i would put this in my top 100 for personal preference of like enjoyment and i'd probably put it in my top 50 for like technical appreciation Mm -hmm. um it's definitely a top 100 for enjoyment because the emotional range of it is just incredible and then the technicality of the decisions and communication that had to be happening on set I'm mm-hmm. in awe mm-hmm. of that because yeah. the, the specificity of certain thoughts and emotions in so little being communicated, I've rarely seen done as this well. Right. So that for that aspect, I'm top 50 or 20 even, but mm-hmm. personal preference, top 100 for sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. Which, by the way, I just want to give, I needed to double check the name of the director, but Celine Siama, just like round of applause for you. That was Gorgeous. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you. Well Thank done. You I'm sorry that done. Argentina destroyed your nation. <laughs> yeah, the, I think the only reason I even hesitated to put it as my number one is because if I had to tell people that a French lesbian film was my number one favorite movie, then they would think they would I never was take you seriously already again. more pretentious than I already am. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>